Welcome and hello. I'm Madison Dennis, Project Manager at Plastic Pollution Coalition. Thank you for joining our March webinar, Filtered Water, Preventing Billions of Plastic Bottles from Flooding U.S. Communities. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a nonprofit communications and advocacy organization that collaborates with an expansive global alliance of organizations, businesses, and individuals to create a more just, equitable, and regenerative world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. We have five poll questions today to get a sense of who is joining us. Each question will only appear for 20 seconds, so please answer quickly. First off, where are you joining us from today? Select one. Okay, so it looks like we've got people joining from all around the world mostly from North America, which makes a lot of sense given the topic. So thank you all for joining. Next question, what best describes the area of focus of your work? Select one. So it looks like we have a large portion from nonprofits and other, but also government, corporation, education, and more. Next question, how concerned are you about the quality of water that comes through your tap or faucet? So unfortunately, we have almost 50% are very concerned with somewhat concerned at 30 and not concerned at 20%. Now, what type of po water pollutants are you concerned about? And this is select multiple. Wow, so we have lots of uh, pollutants that we're concerned about, mostly microplastics at 91%, and then coming in uh, PFAS and also other chemicals and lead. And last question, do you use a filter in your home for drinking and cooking water? It's great. We see that 40% use it for drinking, but not for cooking, and 29% for drinking and cooking. Okay, great. Now, thank you for participating in the poll questions. Today in the webinar, we're going to be hearing from Deandra Cameron from New Jersey Future, Dr. Sherry Sam Mason from Penn State Erie, and John Rumpler from Environment America. But first off, I would like to introduce our campaign, Filtered Not Bottled, that is advocating for filter distribution to provide safe, clean drinking water without causing massive amounts of plastic pollution. There are over 12 million lead pipes bringing water into the homes of 22 million people in the United States disproportionately impacting black, brown, and low-income communities. World health experts agree there is no safe level of lead exposure, especially for children who can face irreversible health consequences from even low levels of exposure. While there has been significant advancements in recent years on lead service line replacement, it will still be 10 years before many cities replace their la last lead line and over 40 years for cities like Chicago to have clean drinking water. Water systems must implement a filter first strategy, providing a filter certified to remove lead to impacted households to provide an immediate safe water source. Providing filters to families could provide an immediate clean drinking water while preventing the use of hundreds of billions of single use plastic bottles over the course of the project. Supplying the 22 million people impacted by lead in the United States with single-use plastic water bottles for just six months would require over 32 billion water bottles. Also, purchasing single-use bottles for drinking and cooking for only one year can cost up to $2,000, which is another financial burden on primarily low-income and underfunded communities. Ensuring expedient distribution of filters and proper education is critical to provide families with safe drinking water as soon as possible without polluting single-use plastics. So I invite you all now to scan the QR code to sign the petition and urge the EPA to not replace lead pipes with plastic pollution. With that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Sam Mason. Dr. Sherry A. Mason, AKA Sam, is the Director of Sustainability at Penn State Erie. 
While a professor of chemistry at SUNY Fredonia, her research group was among the first to study the prevalence and impact of plastic pollution within freshwater ecosystems. Sam has won several awards and has been featured with hundreds of mass media articles, including BBC and the New York Times. Her work formed the basis for the Microbeads Free Water Act, which was signed into law by President Obama in December of 2015. Welcome, Sam. Thank you for having me. So I, I wanted to start with this image of this beautiful vessel. This is the U.S. Brig Niagara. Its home port is Erie, Pennsylvania, where I now live. And this is also the vessel where all of my plastic pollution work started um, about a dozen or so years ago. Um, my work started in the Great Lakes, um, and largest freshwater ecosystem in the entire planet. Um, and what really surprised me in that work is the fact that the vast majority of the samples that we brought into the vessel um, contained not big pieces of plastics like bags and straws, but rather 97% of the plastic that we found in our samples are actually classified as microplastics. Microplastics are any particle of plastic that is between one micron and five millimeters. To give you some idea, five millimeters is about the size of a fingernail. Um, a hair, an average human hair, is the width of a hundred microns. So one micron would be one one hundredth the width of a human hair. So it's a really broad range. Um, these largely result, although there are some microplastics that are manufactured to be micro-sized, largely they um, arise from the breakdown of larger plastic items that we use every day, like the bags, the bottles, the straws, the takeout containers. Nanoplastics, which we'll be talking about later, are even smaller than microplastics. They range in size from one nanometer down to one micron. So they're the small size smaller than microplastics. And in this size range, you're talking things that are about the size of a, of a virus, just to try and give you some, some perspective. My role here today, though, is to talk about my more recent work than what I did on the Niagara my research lab in collaboration with Orb Media and, and Mary Kazut, who is a, a graduate student at the University of Minnesota in the School of Public Health, we conducted the first worldwide assessment of tap water looking for microplastic pollution. Um, we collected a total of 159 samples from across the globe. 83% of them were found to contain microplastic contamination. On average, across the world, this the samples contained five and a half particles microplastics per liter of tap water. If that's shocking to you, and it reminds you of the question that we had at the beginning, well, I have a little bit of worse news for you because my lab also conducted the first assessment of microplastic pollution within bottled water because a lot of people, when they heard about tap water, thought, oh, I'll just drink bottled water as though that would solve the problem. We analyzed the top 11 selling brands, either globally or um, uh, regionally. So for example, in China, the top selling brand is Wahaha, but worldwide, the top selling brands are Aquafina, Dasani, and Nestle Pure Life. Some brands are bottled um, at only one particular source. So for example, Gerolsteiner is only bottled at a particular source in Germany, but many bottled water companies bottle basically wherever they can find a tap. Um, and so in those cases, so for like Dasani and Nestle Pure Life, we would sample them in multiple countries. So in total, we sampled um, 11 top selling brands from 19 different countries analyzing the contents of 259 different bottles of bottled water. What we found was that 93% of these individual bottles contained microplastic pollution, 100% of the brands. So if you didn't see your brand on the next slide, have no fear. I can tell you with 
pretty certainty that it contains microplastic pollution. Um, looking at particles in the same size range as what we did in our tap water study, we found twice as much microplastic within bottled water. So that's the 10 and a half pieces versus the five and a half particles that we fit per liter that we found in tap water. With this study, however, we were able to go down to a smaller size range and we found on average 325 particles of microplastic per liter of bottled water that we tested. Most of these particles were considered fragments. This is very different than what we found in the tap water study where 98% of the particles were fibers. As a scientist, what this tells me is that there's a difference in the source. The plastics that we found within bottled water are largely coming from the act of bottling the water, while, while in the tap water study, the vast majority of the microplastics that we found are probably coming through contact of that water with air. That's going to be much harder to uh, reduce the source of than what we would find in bottled water. If this isn't enough, there was an even more recent study than ours. This came out in just January of this year, January of 2024. This study was developing a new method and is actually able to identify nanoplastics, not just identify that they're there, but actually classify them as plastics. In this study, they found an average of 240,000 particles per liter of bottled water. So three, almost three orders of magnitude higher than our study in bottled water, 90% of those particles were nanoplastics. That's what we're facing. And I move on to the next presenter. Thank you, Sam. That was very enlightening and very shocking. And oh, again, just ensure, ensures why we need to get plastic pollution out of our water. Uh, next up, I'd like to introduce John Rumpler. John Rumpler directs Environment America's effort to protect our rivers, lakes, streams, and drinking water. John's areas of expertise include lead and other toxic threats to drinking water, factory farms, and agribusiness pollution, algal blooms, fracking, and the Federal Clean Water Act. So you know he's probably never bored. <laughs> He previously worked as a staff attorney for Alternatives for Community and Environment and Tobacco Control Resource Center. Welcome, John. Hey, thanks everybody. Great to be here. Um, I'm gonna talk about one of the pollutants that we saw in the survey at the very beginning of our conversation, the concern about lead in drinking water. But I wanna say that some of the other pollutants that we talked about, like PFAS, um, there are also some similar solutions that we can talk about in a bit. What I want to talk about is the need to get the lead out. Um, look, a lot of other pollution of our drinking water is coming from polluters that are dumping stuff into our rivers, lakes, and streams. We've seen this with microplastics. We've seen this with PFAS and some of the other pollution sources that I deal with this week, we were battling corporate agribusiness over the enormous amounts of pollution they dump into our rivers, lakes, and streams. But lead is different. Lead comes from the very pipes and plumbing and fixtures right in our homes, right in our schools and childcare centers where kids go to learn and play every day. And so it really requires a different kind of thinking to remove that dire public health threat before we go to drink our water from the tap. Um, this is really what we want, right? Is we want our kids to have safe drinking water. Kids need water to stay hydrated and healthy throughout the day. And lead is a potent neurotoxin and even low levels of lead can really dramatically affect kids in the way they learn, grow and behave. Unfortunately, lead contamination of drinking water at schools is really widespread. Um, if you just look at this map here where we've summarized the available data from states across the country, whether you're talking about Massachusetts or Arizona, 
um, more than half of the taps tested in schools found some level of lead in the water. In Texas, upwards of 70% of the schools had at least one tap with lead in the water. The same was true in several other states, Montana, Washington, on and on. Um, every place where there's comprehensive data, um, as shown in the darker blue states, it's showing widespread contamination. And what's the reason? Again, because lead was baked right into those pipes and plumbing and fixtures. Now, the good news, as was alluded to in the introduction, is that finally, after several years of organizing by grassroots activists across the country and advocacy organizations like ours, we convinced Congress to uh, allocate an unprecedented $15 billion uh, and, uh, towards removing lead pipes, these lead service lines that go from the water main in the street into people's homes. And um, the EPA is proposing to require water utilities to remove those pipes in the next 10 years. That's fantastic. We hope that moves forward as fully as possible, except for two things. Again, one, as pointed out in the, in the beginning intro, we still need to protect folks from contamination during those 10 years. Um, so we're going to need filters. And the second thing that I really want to drive home in this presentation is that in schools, most of the contamination is not coming from lead service lines. Most school buildings are too big to have lead service lines. Instead, it's the pipes in the school, the plumbing fixtures, the faucets, the fountains. And so even if we fully implement the lead and copper rule the way EPA has proposed it, and even if we could remove all of those lead service lines tomorrow, we would still have pervasive lead contamination where kids go to learn and play every day. And of course, as I was mentioning, you know, lead is really bad for kids, even at very low levels. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that schools limit lead in drinking water to one part per billion. And I say that, I think all the doctors and nurses and other health professionals would say there's no safe level of lead, but one part per billion is sort of the an enforceable something we can measure um, in terms of lead in water. So again, this just shows in this schematic how we got to this problem. Lead is not from our rivers, lakes, and streams. It's not coming from the drinking water plant. It's coming from the service lines in homes and other small buildings, but in schools, it's everything else on this chart in most cases. I don't want to say no schools have lead service lines, but in general, most school buildings are too big to be getting all the water they need for, from a two-inch diameter lead pipe. So you can see all of the different places. And to give you an idea, if you're asking, well, gee, my kid's school you know, was only built uh, a decade or two ago. Well, the federal limits on how much lead can be in a pipe or a faucet or a fountain were not dramatically limited until 2014. They went down to 8% lead by average surface area in contact with water down to 0.25%. And even some tests of post-2014 fixtures have found some level of lead in the water. So wherever we are, where our kids go to school, there is likely a strong risk of drinking water contamination because of lead in the building. How do we solve this problem? Well, intuitively, the most core thing we need to do is get the lead out, right? So we talked about replacing those lead pipes called lead service lines in people's homes. We're going to need to replace fountains in schools with water stations that have filters built in to remove lead. We're gonna to need to do the same with faucets and plumbing where we can. Um, and ideally, all of the new materials should be as close to lead-free as possible. The standard that we're seeing that's been adopted in California is Q less than or equal to one, meaning that the amount of lead that would leach out of that material is less than one part per billion. Again, that American Academy of Pediatrics standard. But number one, it's going to take a long time to get the lead out. And number two, 
um, there's going to be some plumbing and piping that we're never going to be able to, you know, we're not going to dig up the foundation of a school to remove every pipe. And so this is why filters are also a critical part of the solution, ensuring that water stations do have filters, ensuring that other taps used for cooking and drinking and beverage prep in schools are indeed having filters that are certified to remove lead. The standard you want to look for is National Sanitation Foundation or ANSI 53 for removing lead and 42 for removing particulate matter. I might have those numbers reversed, but those are the two things that you're looking for in the standards to ensure that the lead is removed from the water. So here's what's happening policy-wise at the national level. As I said, that the, the EPA has finally proposed a revision to the lead and copper rule, really good in terms of mandating the replacement of those lead pipes in the street that go into about 9 million people's homes, but really falling down on the job when it comes to schools and childcare centers, the proposed lead and copper rule does little more than require some more sporadic and fairly uh, unreliable testing, it does not mandate filters, replacement of fountains and so forth. So we're working with the national PTA, both of the national teachers unions, the National Association of School Nurses to press EPA to do better for our kids and educators um, in schools and child care centers. Michigan is really the outstanding example of a filter-first prevention-oriented approach, um, working with allies in the Great Lakes state. We and others managed to convince the Michigan legislature to pass precedent-setting law requiring filters at all taps used for cooking and drinking in schools. And I want to say that locally, communities are starting to take action too, from Philadelphia to San Diego to a number of other school districts that are starting to take this prevention-oriented approach, which in almost all cases involves filters as a critical thing. And this is how we can ensure safe drinking water at the tap instead of having people running to more bottled water. I should remind folks that, I mean, I, I, I hate to, to reference Baltimore given the horrible tragedy that Baltimore has just suffered with the collapse of the key bridge, um, but Baltimore public schools have been on bottled water since 2007 because of lead contamination. And while we admire the fact that Baltimore public schools took some action to ensure that kids are not drinking water with lead, we would submit that filters and get the lead out tactics are the way to go rather than bottled water. Um, the good news is we don't need to wait for the federal government or state agencies to take action. Our get the lead out toolkit, there's a hyperlink in this slide, gives local activists all the tools that they need to take action with their local school board to demand that we do filters and replacement of fountains instead of switching over to bottled water, or is more likely the case, just letting kids continue to drink lead contaminated water. Our toolkit has facts on the problem, sources on solution, um, resources for costing out how much it will cost, to uh, do filter first in your school system, as well as funding sources available and activist materials and links to all kinds of resources so you can back up your arguments. Of course, you can also contact me here, John Rumpler at Environment America, Jay Rumpler at environmentamerica.org. Happy to work with local activists to help you and your school board move forward and get the lead out. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that very important history and update on lead service line replacement and really highlighting how filters fit into the solution. Uh, my colleague, Erica Serino, is sharing some of those links mentioned in the chat. So thank you for that as well. And now I would like to introduce our final panelist, Deandra Cameron. Deandra Cameron develops and advances New Jersey state policies that affect health, water infrastructure, and redevelopment with a primary focus on lead in drinking water. 
She serves as the backbone staff to Jersey Waterworks Lead and Drinking Water Task Force, working closely with Lead Free New Jersey Collaborative. Before joining New Jersey Future, Deandra was a Monmouth County Health Department case investigator. We're pleased to have you with us today, Deandra. Thank you, Madison. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I wanted to provide a visual of uh, the lead service line, and I think John touched on this a little bit, uh, but the lead service line is the piece that connects um, the water coming from the water main that the water system provides to your house. And along the lead service line, even if pipes aren't made of lead, they could be lead connectors. Um, and they're sometimes referred to as goosenecks or pigtailed. And so um, for pipes, if they have to bend corners and they're curvy, sometimes the piece that connects them are made of lead, even if the pipes themselves aren't made of lead. Um, and so this is important to note that along with the lead lines inside your homes as well, there, there could be lead fixtures. Um, and I think John touched on this, that in schools, it's not necessarily the lead line so much, but it's these lead fixtures, which are pigtails, goosenecks, and lead solder. So in 2019, the Jersey Waterworks Collaborative uh, got together and created a 2019 report, which recommended that the state of New Jersey should remove all its lead lines within 10 years. And we were able to have that uh, law pass in 2021. So the state of New Jersey is about two years into um, a law to replace all its lead service lines. And we're excited that the EPA has proposed that all states get on, get on this 10 year timeline. What's um, interesting about the New Jersey law is that we've redefined what we determine to be lead. So in New Jersey, we have an expanded definition of lead. So in New Jersey, when we are required to remove the lead lines, you also have to remove any galvanized pipes, any goosenecks and pigtails, which isn't traditionally um, what folks uh, recommend what folks refer to when they recommend moving the lead line. Um, so we have an expanded definition of lead, um, which is great because it doesn't leave the connected pieces, even if they're connected by two galvanized pipes. Um, and the second really interesting thing about the New Jersey law is that we outlawed what is called partial replacements. Um, it's been a challenge for New Jersey, but we believe that is the way that it should go. Um, so when we talk about partial replacements, we're referring to what uh, water systems have been traditionally responsible for. They've been traditionally responsible for the piece of the line that connects the main um, that connects their water main to the house, but not the piece of the line that connects the ha the house from the yard to inside the home. And so typically when uh, water systems have been removing service lines, they've just been removing the utility piece. In New Jersey, um, we've outlawed that partial replacement. And now um, by 2031, all our water systems have to replace both the uh, utility side of the service line and the customer side of the service line. Um, and so that posed a, a few challenges. Um, and so right now in our approach to this, we're now recommending um, that states um, go for a no cost share approach to their lead service lines. Um, and this involves, because systems aren't traditionally responsible for the customer side, they may now decide that the customers have to pay a portion of the cost of the lead service line. And so we're also advocating that this not be the case. Clean, safe, lead-free drinking water um, should be a public health right. Um, and so in conjunction with our goal of 2031, we're also now actively working that no one has to pay um, for the lead line. So what we're doing uh, beginning 2022, uh, systems were um, required to submit an annual update of their inventory, a replacement plan, um, and talk about how they're planning on replacing the lead service lines for their, their systems. And so in New Jersey, your water system should have an a, a inventory online that's required by law. So you can now go to your system's website um, and see if you have a lead line by your address. Um, so when we passed the lead service line um, law, 
we realized that 10 years was a nice timeline, but what happens if you're not on schedule to um, replace your lead line until maybe 2030 or 2029? Uh, we realized that filters were a big part of the conversation. And so what we've encouraged not only water systems to do, but community organizers and different um, organizations that are protecting the public's health is to make recommendations and stronger policies around proactive filter distribution. So right, um, I've provided a few sort of questions around filter distribution, and this is for um, anyone who is in the business of protecting the public health. Um, we want to think about when in the process you're distributing filters if, if you are replacing lead lines. And you could distribute filters when there is an, an ALE, which is a, an action level exceedance, but we don't recommend this. But this is usually what water systems do. Um, and, and ALE is when the water is tested above 15 parts per billion. We already know that there's no safe level of lead. Um, so we know that 15 ppb is not a health-based standard. So filter distribution should be way before um, there is an, an actual action level exceedance. Um, you want to decide if you're replacing lead lines, whether you want to um, whether you want to distribute your filters um, before proactively, so you don't prevent so you prevent individuals from going out and purchasing cases of, cases of water because they believe that the water coming from the tap isn't safe. So you want to proactively um, get ahead of that, and then who the filters are distributed to um, is a big part of the conversation. And one of the reasons why this needs to be discussed is that if you think about renters, if you are a renter, sometimes you are not the payer of your water bill, and sometimes you. You don't get um, regulatory communication from your water system. And so if you're a landlord and maybe you receive um, information that your um, water has a, a lead level exceedance and maybe they give you the option to request or receive a filter, you're not actually the person living in that apartment. Um, and so folks want to think critically about how we're protecting residents and who's the payer of that water bill, who can um, receive a filter and who has access to even the notification um, in terms of what's actually in their water, if there's any contaminant. Um, and then how filters will be um, how filters will be provided and the instructions to use them. One of the things about filters is that you have to change the cartridges. And so you want to think about the education that you're doing around filter distribution. So after we've passed the 10, 10, 10 year lead service replacement law, we're now in year two, we started thinking more about tenants and we realized that we're asking water systems to disclose to every resident whether or not they have a lead service line. And so we realized that some water systems don't even have their inventory. They're not sure where the lead lines are and they may be communicating to just the property owner whether or not they have a lead line. And in New Jersey, the notification could simply say, your service line is unknown. We're not sure, we're looking at our inventory. We didn't think this was enough to protect residents, especially tenants. So what we've pursued in New Jersey is what we call a lead service line disclosure law. And it recommends, it, it um, provides that the landlord must disclose certain lead and drinking water information to the tenant at tenant turnover. Um, and in multifamily buildings, place that um, information in, in a public area. And what we recommended is that tenants should know whether or not they have a lead service line. And if the utility hasn't figured that out yet, then the tenant should be able to, to be told when the property was built. Um, and if it was built before 1986, there's a strong possibility that it's served by a lead line. And so that could prompt the tenant to get their elevated blood lead levels checked. It could prompt them to use a filter. It could prompt them to ask their landlord if they are planning to replace the lead service line. And it also, um, furnishes education materials and information on filters. Um, and so we're pursuing that right now. It's not quite law yet, um, but we're um, positive that this is something that we can achieve this year to protect tenants and especially non-payers of the water bill. We're also pursuing 
protections for child care facilities, especially the child care facilities that, in, that are in rental um, properties. In New Jersey, we have state regulated child care facilities. And so it's, it's sort of easy to mandate that they are checking um, the lead action levels and that they are um, required by the state to remove their lead service lines, but for um, child care facilities who are in rental properties, and in New Jersey, if you care for more than five children, you're not required to register your child care facility. So it's not binding um, for them to report to the state. And so what we're pursuing in legislation is that if you are a, a landlord who's operating your facility for the purpose of a child care facility, and if you've refused to replace the lead service line, then we mandate um, that you put in a filter. And when we say refuse to, to replace the lead service line, it could be for a number of reasons. Sometimes there are recalcitrant landlords. They don't live in the property. They don't drink the water. So sometimes they're not, um, they don't care much about the property. And sometimes because there's this cost share, they don't want to pay $1,000. And so they don't choose to replace it. And so we're mandating that if they have a problem with replacing the lead lines, until we can get the funds to uh, make it free for everyone, we're mandating that they put in a filter to protect children. I won't go over this too much, but um, I've just um, shared here what the certification marks look like. And John, I think you had the numbers right. Um, so John mentioned this a little bit, and this is um, what the, the marks look like. So you'll be able to, um, this is a visual of what um, this, the, um, the certification marks look like for the filters um, that are certified to remove um, lead and, and particulate. And this is just a visual of the written text. Um, this is what you would see um, on the packaging if you're looking for um, whether or not it takes it out. So sometimes it'll say heavy metals and you'll see mercury, lead, cadmium, and it'll say particulate. Um, and you can read the fine print to see um, if it reduces lead. The last slide is you, you just want to run your water. What happens with lead is that if it sits there and it's... Um, the lead seeps into the water, especially overnight. Um, you want to run the water a couple minutes so that it 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 can reduce the lead. You want to use a filter, and um, unfortunately, with lead, um, boiling the water does not work. It could actually uh, make it worse. So, just a few tips. Thank you. Thank you, Deandra. It was really compelling to see the wide federal work being done on lead service line replacement, and also see how that's enacted in your state of New Jersey. So we really appreciate you providing that background. We're now going to move on to the discussion part of our panel. I'll be starting by asking our panelists some questions submitted by attendees ahead of time. But please also feel free to ask questions in the Q&A feature, which we've been answering as we move along. And we'll do our best to answer them live as well. So first up, uh, Oh, this is a question I'm thinking Deandra and John may be best to answer. What laws or rules do you want enacted in order to protect communities during lead service line replacement? Yeah, I think some of the ones I just mentioned, but I think on a local level, we, we need to see more ordinances at the municipal level, ordinances that are gonna mandate replacement of the lead line and ordinances that are gonna make them free um, so a no cost share for residents and also a big part of it is a right of entry ordinance that is going to say anyone can open the door for the inspection or the replacement. For tenants, it's very hard if you're not a homeowner, what can you sign off on? So that means the utility may knock and you have a lead line and you have to sit with that because there's no law saying you're able to have that inspected or have that um, removed. Yeah, I'll just add um, that we don't want to trade one toxic hazard for another. So even though we want the lead lines replaced and we want to use filters until that's completely done, the other thing we want to make sure of is that water utilities don't choose to use cheap and toxic PVC pipe to replace those lead pipes um, for two reasons. One is that we already know for sure that in the manufacture of polyvinyl chloride and the transport of polyvinyl chloride, that there's tremendous toxic and pollution risks. Um, so even before it gets 
to being installed. And second is we really don't know um, what the potential is for PVC pipes to leach harmful materials into people's drinking water. And as we've tragically learned over decades and decades of lead pipes, um, you know, once we put those pipes in the ground, they're going to be there for a really long time. So I think in addition to saying yes to filters, we want to say no to PVC replacement pipes. And Deandra, what reminded me of that is your focus on local and state authorities. EPA is not sure they have the authority to tell water utilities that they cannot use PVC. I don't know, I haven't done the legal research, but let's just assume that's the case. But state legislatures and county authorities and water utility boards certainly can decide to reject PVC, and that's exactly what they should do. Thank you. That was super helpful background. And if you sc scanned that QR code and saw the petition, there is also a section on choosing safer alternatives and not choosing PVC pipes. And I also just want to uplift also what John mentioned before, and it is that the EPA is currently revising the lead and copper rule improvement. So I know that many of us on the panel today have submitted recommendations to the EPA that are currently being considered regarding filtration in schools, filters in homes, better practices for lead service line replacement themselves. So these are also things that we hope to see in the finalized rule, which we can expect in October of 2024. Okay, and then I have another question. Um, we got a few people asking this. So we see that filters often are plastic, especially with pitcher filters. And if there are any um, solutions that don't involve plastic, if there's recycling opportunities for those filters, and if we should be concerned about, you know, the filter or the pitcher itself leaching microplastics or other uh, water pollutants. And I think I can open that up to the panel if anyone would like to comment. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't want to answer this question. Um, <laughs> uh, there are some um, metal pitchers and some um, reusable filters out there. They, um, it, unfortunately, I mean, they're, they're, they're they're cost prohibited from, I mean, it's it's a privilege basically to be able to afford them. And we are specifically talking here about the fact that this is an issue that is mostly focused on black, brown and low income communities where that is um, difficult. So, um, but there are those options out there. And if you're lucky enough to be able to afford them, please uh, make use of those. Um, I would assume that the, plastic filters themselves are going to release some plastic um, as they are used. Um, this will be highest when they're first used um, and probably decrease over time. Although as plastic ages, it tends to increase emissions again. So you see this a lot with like clothing um, and, you know, initially synthetic clothes will emit a lot, decrease over time, but then increase as they age. Um, similarly, as the pitcher itself is older, it's going to have the same kind of effect, right, where it's going to decrease initially, but as it ages and it gets, um, especially if it's ever sitting out in the sunlight and it gets brittle, um, it's going to start to um, increase its fragmentation, um, and so you're going to be getting more micro and nanoplastics into your water. Um, that being said, obviously, that is preferable to drinking lead tainted water. <laughs> so this is why I didn't want to answer it. You know, if you have lead in your water, don't drink it. <laughs> um, you know, go for a Brita pitcher over that. Um, there is no uh, recycling of, of plastic, you know, uh, filters um, that I am aware of. And uh, Sam, if I can, just to add on to your question, I think your um, presentation illustrated that the amount of plastic waste that would be generated from people using plastic water bottles is like magnitudes greater 
than the than the plastic that would be generated from using these filters, right? That's true. I mean, it's so you have to always with this with this issue with plastic, it's always kind of a you have to think of it as a spectrum, right? And it's like you're just trying to continually get better. And so yes, that this you know a, a filter is going to produce a lot less plastic waste than a bottle. And so that is a much better, you know, um, much more advantageous solution. Absolutely. It's a very good point. Thank you, John. Thank you. That's super helpful. We know we ideally have a perfect solution, but in this case, the damage of lead is often irreversible, especially in children. So providing a cost-effective solution as soon as possible really needs to be the priority. And then, yeah. Us at Plastic Pollution Coalition, and I'm sure uh, my colleagues here as well, are continuing to just push for industry to come up with better solutions as well in the future. So while it's not perfect, uh, we think it's the best solution we have right now, and would take you know huge steps to protect children and families while also reducing billions and billions of plastic water bottles. Now, Sam, I also wanted to ask a question on boiling water. So we've seen some recent commentary on boiling water in areas like DC where lead is an issue, but also in areas where there's microplastics. And this may be also a good question for Deandra as well. Does this have any merit? Will boiling help for microplastics or lead? Yeah, it was a look, it was it was an interesting scientific study that came out and then it was picked up by the mass media and really kind of made it sound like this was a solution. It's not um, you know, basically, one, you have to have hard water because there has to be some calcium carbonate on it. And what the study looked at is in hard water, if you boil it, the plastic and the calcium carbonate would come together and would fall out a solution. And so then if you drink the water that's, you know, coming off of it, they were specifically, it was a, it was out of China. They were specifically looking, talking about the fact that a lot of Chinese Asian populations drink a lot of tea and they're like, so if you boil your water before drinking tea, it'll have less like microplastics. The, the biggest issue with the study is that when you boil water with plastic in it, all of the chemicals that are in the plastic are going to leach out of that plastic into the water that you are then going to drink. So like it was very short sighted study, you know, they were looking at one particular thing and they found it. And so on a scientific basis, was it kind of interesting and merit being published? Sure, if the normal like 10 scientists read it, but instead it gets picked up by the mass media and it and 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 key pieces of it that are important for the public discourse were left out. And I think that that is critically important. So boiling water is not a solution to this problem. And uh, Deandra, I'll let you comment, but I know you already said it's it doesn't work for lead. So yeah, it um it does not work for lead. And being a metal, we've there has been some research that it sticks to your pot and your metal utensils. And so, you know, maybe you boil it and then it sticks to your pot, but then you fry an egg and then it comes off into your. So, you know, you can't. Yeah, it's um, it's tricky, and I think um, you're not. It, what's also tricky is that there are some things that boiling works for, and so when there's a flood or something, and there's a boil water advisory, if your water is coming through a lead pipe and there's lead in it, it's like use a filter because you're boiling the lead contaminated water because maybe there's a natural disaster and the water isn't clean, but that it's it's there's too many contaminants at play and it doesn't i think what minimizes because it doesn't get rid of it what minimizes one thing may make another thing worse so from the tap before it gets to your body i would say filter as much as you can yeah it's tricky great thank you so much for all the commentary we're just about at the hour so we're going to need to wrap oh, up this really great was, conversation oh god john I was just going to say, Maddie, there was one question about PFAS, which I uh, in the, that I saw in the chat, and I know I had promised to get at it. So yeah. really quickly, you know, the good news, if there is any good news, is that PFAS is not coming from people's plumbing, right? And so a drinking water utility should be able to remove PFAS at the drinking water purification 
people should not need individual PFAS filters in their homes unless they are on well water. If they're on well water, then obviously they're going to need PFAS filters. But what we really hope is that water utilities are removing PFAS centrally instead of thousands and millions of homeowners having to purchase PFAS removing filters. Um, so just wanted to get that point in. No, it's it's uh, super helpful. Glad you hopped in because I know PFAS is a big concern to people these days. Um, so with that, we're going to be wrapping up. So thank you so much to Deandra, Dr. Sam, and John for joining us today and providing great information and such a valuable conversation. If you missed the chance earlier, please take a moment now to scan the QR code and sign our petition now to urge the EPA to not replace lead pipes with plastic pollution. And you can also see in our resources more links from our panelists. Now, everyone, please mark your calendars for our next webinar on Wednesday, April 17th, People versus Plastic, How the UN Plastics Treaty Must Protect Our Health. And if you haven't already, we invite you to join our global coalition. It is currently free to join as an individual, business, or nonprofit organization. If you can connect with us on social media to learn more about our work, we will also be sending out a follow-up survey after the webinar and appreciate your feedback to help us improve our future events. We will also be sending out the recording of the webinar in the coming days so that you can share it with anyone who is unable to join today. Thanks again to everyone for joining and thanks also to our Plastic Pollution Coalition member groups and partners who shared this webinar with their communities and networks. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar on Wednesday, April 17th. So see you soon.